Hey, I'm Warren Claff. Welcome to my podcast. Joy, Lou, thank you for coming today. Yeah. We have done podcasts before right. and you came here in person, which is amazing. When people come here in person, this is a weird trick. I do because I like to jump in on top of people. I like to, so you came in here in person, you deserve right. the airtime. So I drink a bubbly drink, which keeps me from talking. So if you try to do a podcast while drinking a bubbly drink, it prevents being immediately going into exposition because, you know, bubbly drinks prevent you from talking and it lets your guests talk. Oh, okay. That's the trick. So, yeah, it is. Welcome. And I like the flavor also. Great. This is mine you, because we need you to talk. <laughs> you don't get one. You just get to suffer oh, and, right. oh. and speak. So the topic we're going to talk about is macros. The last time we talked, I think we admitted that I barely know what macros are. I'm new to the subject, but I love it. And most people don't know like the, what macros are, why macros matter, what it is, what the subject is, but I love it. It's so important to the projects I'm doing, but for a layman, help them understand what a macro is, why you follow it, and why mm -hmm. it's so important to everybody. First, I doubt that you know very little about macro first, but and then I do think macro is, imp is important because Look at what happened to 2020. So if you don't understand macro, what's going to happen later, you're going to feel like, what, why is it going that way? You look at the monetary policy, you look at the fiscal policy, they're having somewhat of a conflict in some way. Like, how do you wrap your head around, why is this stock market going like crazy? Why is all this valuation going crazy? And then if you're an investor, especially, or a project manager, you may lose your track. Like, you're starting to doubt what's going on in the market and then you lose your direction and then you probably have a wrong plan for what's going to happen later in the next year or the year later I'll give you a very good example during 2021 or 2020 the whole two or three years we had a very bad supply chain problem global wise Part of the reason is, I guess, China, of course, is under big lockdown, so all this manufacturing business are not really producing anything. But, like we all know, everything's made in China, at least before today. Now it's a little bit different. A lot of people realize, a lot of countries realize that, oh my God, I can't even produce my own toilet paper. That's the moment a lot of the companies realize, okay, there's supply chain problem, something needs to be fixed, and then the macro view is there might be some kind of shift in this manufacturer industry. Like we cannot always rely on Chinese who made it everything made in China. That could be a way that you're seeing a lot of the factories start moving out from China to Vietnam, Mexico. So those are the change. If you don't understand macro, then you'll be like, why am I losing my direction? Why is my prediction on try to make everything in China is like, is it still going to last for another 10 years? Why is it not there anymore? That's basically a real life phenomenon. But what the macro effect market? So I think in some ways, if you're in a local market in the United States, you have right. many macros. Yeah. And for example, if you're in San Diego, so my son plays ice hockey, except we're in San Diego, Southern California. So there's right. not a lot of ice. And so there were two sheets of ice in Escondido. <laughs> and so they lost their lease and those got shut down. So then it pushed all the players that went on those into the other three rinks mm -hmm. that are in San Diego. And now we have more demand than supply right. of ice in San Diego for ice hockey players. And so that created chaos in the local market because now we can't get full sheet ice for skating. And you can't, my son's a defenseman. Mm -hmm. So for half sheet ice, you can grow or you can educate or you can train an offenseman because they have to skate and turn and twist and like little half sheet ice, you can get very skilled. So right. you need backward skating full sheet. Mm -hmm. So now what's happening in our local market, our defensemen are not competitive with the other markets right. because they don't have backward skating. All this, these are macros. You wouldn't call them in your local market. These are just like, oh yeah, we lost a sheet of ice or there's been some changes, but a change in supply and demand yes. affects market activity right. and that spills over into other markets, which then have to supply your market or can compete more aggressively. And that's really what I think of macros. Now you raise that up to the Fed, to interest rates, right. to strategic, to defense, to military, to manufacturing, and now you're talking real macros. 
but the effect of it is can be as meaningful as the way to think about it is another 7-Eleven. So you see that in hospitality. Right. So in hospitality, if another newer hotel chain market yeah. anticipating growth, right, but that growth hasn't really spurted yet, now you have two ho similar hotels sharing the same hospitality traffic, and now both have to lower their prices right. if the market doesn't grow. So these are all macros, right? Those are right. easy ones to Those figure out. Those are the out. easy ones Those that you can see every day in your correct. daily life. Yeah. And the macro concept of that is basically called, is technically called Bullwhip effect. So it's basically a difference between supply and demand in the same market. Then you all say, you like, Go back to the toilet paper. I think that's easier for people to understand. We say two by fours, <laughs> two by fours. Right. So, mm. anyways, back in 2020, yeah. we see that's this toilet paper. People instead of needing one big or 20 roll of 24 roll of toilet paper, people wants to buy like four of these in a right. week. Why? Because people are expecting that they're not gonna get enough toilet paper in the next four weeks. All of a sudden, what you're looking at is a huge increase in demand. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a supply chain issue globally. And then not every country can be produced, sadly, produce their own toilet paper, so you have to import. So when you're trying to import, but there's supply chain problem, so the supply chain break the supply to the country, to the local market, but the local market need more. So what's gonna happen is your demand is a lot larger than the supply, the, the price will increase. So this is what people were experiencing every day in their Costco. They can't get toilet paper, can get paper towel. This is macro in real life. But like you said, if you go on top of this, this top tier, what's happening in the macro uh, perspective, there is demand and supply in dollar. So that has to do a lot with uh, monetary policy and then the fiscal policy, how the government will print a lot of money. Well, I'm saying the fiscal policy, printing a lot of money, give it to the people, spend, and then there's too much money in the market, which is causing everything to go up price, which become an inflation. So a macro is very tightly, I guess, the whole economy is about supply and demand. Doesn't matter if it's your toilet paper, doesn't matter if it's a food or energy or even the currency itself. It all have to do with the supply and demand. And the reason I wanted to talk to you is because the importance, if you're an entrepreneur, exactly. if you're raising money, if you are taking orders from people, there's two views. One is you functionally need to have an understanding of supply and demand so you can make business decisions. Right. That isn't really like outside of my concerns. I feel like more from the pitch side, if somebody does not believe that the macros, the moving tectonic, economic tectonic plates in your industry, why would they give you as a fund manager, as an entrepreneur, right. as a, somebody who, a, a large order in sales, capital raising, or a fund, why would they give you any money if they don't believe you understand the tectonic plates of economic yes. policy and what's going to happen in your Exactly. Oh, how I usually describe macro, your understanding of macro is your understanding of how to play the game in business. So let's just imagine you're playing a game, you're trying to win, but you don't know the rules of yeah. how to play this game. Then you can tell what's going to happen, then you're going to lose. So understanding macro is basically understanding the rule of uh, money or the rule of business. So if let's say an investor come to you and be like, oh, I want to hear about your project and you give a synopsis, but there's nothing about why I'm standing in where I'm my position today because of the rule of the game today played this way. That's why I'm standing here. This is a very strong way to tell the investor, you know why I'm doing this, because I know the rules, I know how to play the game, and I'm standing where I am, that's the advantage of where we should go. Yeah, so you want to be positioning your business, your fund, your ideas, to take advantage of where monetary policy and monetary effects are going ahead of time. So for example, in my business, we're buying $26 million of equipment in Italy. And so I wired the other day a million dollars. We buy equipment in euros. Oh yeah. Now you're laughing at me. So they're like, hey, you didn't send enough money. I'm like, I, I converted euros to dollars. I sent that amount, what's the problem? The euro changed in value by the time they booked the money and they're like, right. you didn't pay enough. 
right? Yeah. You underpaid. I'm like, I paid. Now I have the currency risk because I'm buying so much equipment. I'm like, oh my God, on a $3 million uh, payment, exactly. I can lose $150,000 from not knowing what the likely movement is in currency. So to you, how could I then get tactical. So given I have this real problem, next July 10th, I have to send three and a half million dollars from the US to Italy. How can I get ahead of the macros or my risk that the currency is going to move during the time that money is in movement? So if I send on a Friday, they might not get it to a Tuesday, even though it's going through the wire system. Just from timing, it's nine hours difference. Yes. It's across a weekend, they could have a holiday. And so you're talking like a four or five day spread between I send and they receive and book. From a macro standpoint, what can I do to get some sense of timing and play, know the rules of the game as they're currently being played? I think we'll go back to the supply and demand and the monetary policy. Let's go for a, a little bit extreme example. Let's say the European Central Bank all of a sudden have a meeting on Friday and be like, we're going to cut the rate. Yes, you're cutting the rate. But the other way of thinking about that is the money got cheaper. So when the money got cheaper, it's all relatives. So that means the euro compared to the US, which is not cutting rate, that means it's gonna become cheaper compared to the, the US dollar. That way, if you're in the United States, you're wiring money to Europe, that means you're at a better position. Yeah. Because even though even just the meeting, let's say, happened on Friday in Europe, and then there's no rate cut here in the United awesome. States. Yeah. Even though it's just a few days you're still taking advantage of the currency privilege there as a U.S. dollar holder. I think looking at the interest rate change matters a lot. So that in that case would be like rate cut ARB. Yes, yeah. it's arbitrage, basically. Yeah. There's a different ways of doing arbitrage, but it can be just interest rate arbitrage or geography. That's like daily kind of example is why you go to Mexico for dentist because the U.S. dollar compared to Mexican pesos or is a stronger currency. You just go across the, the board yeah. you'll find a dentist in Mexico. You're going to save a lot of money. Yeah. So geographic ar yes. arbitrage. Yes. Yeah. Different way of doing this geographic or just currency arbitrage, even though just a few days difference, it can make a huge impact on your business. What are the industries most sensitive to macro movement where you have to be the most on top of it? Or is it just cut across all industries, all sectors? I think there are a few, uh, there are a few examples. Let's just say real estate, because that's the one that I'm closest with. The real estate, less what happened yeah. in 2020, it's the lowest interest you could get. Let's say it's zero. It's they don't really say it's zero because Federal Reserve's ad it's not really zero, but it is. Yeah. It is zero. Even though the real estate mortgage rate is actually based on a ten year yield, but we don't really want to get too much into that. But just remember that's the lowest interest rate you can ever get probably in the next you know, 10, 20 years in the United States, which is another way of saying it's cheap money. Yeah. If you buy real estate, let's say during the 2020, 2021, you get the lowest rate and plus if it's fixed rate, then you're making sure that the cost on money of buying an asset is really cheap if you're locking that with that rate. And what's happening now is the interest rate above 5%. That is the federal funds rate. Basically, what we call it is a federal rate. It's I, an easy way to say yeah. that. So I call it the free money rate. Yeah. Is that accurate? <laughs> Yeah, basically, there's is the rate that's between the banks. So the that's banks. the lowest you can get pretty much in the market. And then on top of that, the lenders will add their little share. And then so eventually what today is like a mortgage rate is like what, eight. Depends on what kind of industry you can get different rate on top of that. But let's say just real estate, you are probably looking at if it's a fixed rate, it can be 8% or 9%. That's like a probably a 4% difference compared to two, three years ago. That means you're paying a lot extra on your mortgage as a real estate investor. This all going to take out from your profit. So that's how this interest rate will affect your investment. But also for a lot of the companies, if they want to borrow some money, there are many ways to think about this. Let's say I'm a company, I'm Google. I want to borrow a lot of money, maybe to expand my, I don't know, equipment or just you no know, office space, any kind of purpose. The money that I borrow a lot of times are not fixed rate. It can be floating rate, 
meaning it goes up and down. Yeah. Why is it important? Because as Google, I want to sell my debt and pack it into a bond and sell it to the investors. So as an investor, investors don't want to have a fixed return kind of bond. They want a bond that goes up and down with the interest rate. So that's what an investor wants to buy. So that track back to when Google asking for a loan, they will get a floating rate loan, floating rate debt, which also means as the interest rate, the federal funds rate go up, Google is going to pay more on the loan. The cost of the money go up for Google. Of course, what you're seeing now is a lot of the tech companies are cutting their employees. Why? The cost of money has to come from somewhere. You either make a lot larger you know, revenue profit out of the market, which we can tell is really not that kind of market, or what you do is save. You save from your payroll. So that's why people are seeing there's layoff, there's people getting fired, there's a whole department getting cut. That's why. Got it. So if I'm going to be investing $100 million, that $100 million, instead of costing me $5.5 million annually, it's now costing me $9 million mm -hmm. annually. So I'm spending $4 million more for the money. And so that means I can spend $4 million less on either snacks, but snacks are not that expensive. <laughs> but really the most expensive thing is labor. And so it's the easiest right. thing to cut. Let's go through our labor, see who we can cut, make up, because we can't change the cost of money, but we can change the amount of labor that we have, right. especially then when things were very cheap, we added a bunch of labor because it felt good. It felt like we could get more done. And we felt like we needed it to compete against the competition, but was also adding labor and we got sucked up into that whole cycle. So this is why macros matters a lot. So let's talk about this term free money rate. So if we're going to teach people, let's teach people like four or five basic terms. The yeah. one I love that make you feel like the investor uh, has a sense that you understand the issues and what's happening in the market. So free money rate is really what banks can borrow at. So if they borrow at five and a half and they gave you a loan at five and a half, you'd be getting money for free. Right. Because they, that's what they got it from the Fed from. Is that right? Yes. Base, y yes and no. They're... There right, are this a lot is my podcast. Mechanisms. Okay, you just have to say yes. That's right. I mean, it yes. can be wrong, but you just say yes. <laughs> That's right. And then we can okay. we'll fix it in post. <laughs> right. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> So basically, that's the lowest rate the bank can get. And bank is right. not going to make 0% when they blend it to you and me. So what's going to happen so is they're they giving us free money. Percentage. They have to add a few percentage on top of that. And then, of course, we have to pay the extra. I say, people say, hey, what is the debt going to cost you? And I go, hey, the free money rate plus six. Yes, that's the, called the spread. The spread. So it's what the banks can get the money for. And then the spread above that yes, is it's what's what going to cost me, which is going to be 11, 12. What do you think? The debt rates really are, in your experience today, for small business, middle market lending. Lend to? From banks to middle market. If a private lender makes a loan to a $30, $50 million A credit company of $10, $15 million for general purposes, equipment acquisition, general growth, healthy firm, B credit in a Midwest market, what do you think? The bank rate plus the spread is going to be what today? Probably, I would say, I didn't follow exactly your case, but I would say somewhere, it could be somewhere between 8 to the highest I heard is 11. And it also has a lot to do with the quality of the project. Yeah. That has, like, I've seen, I was just actually talking to um, a friend of mine. He's a fam family office guy. And he sold his uh, funding company to a local bank. Is one of the biggest community bank in um, Texas. For him, that's a very special case because he sold his funding company majority, at least, to this bank. He's getting a 2% rate. Oh, my God. That's 2% rate for a lot of people that that's getting 11% is very painful. Yeah. But it depends on where you are in the game. That has a lot to do with what you can get. Cheat the rule, basically. You have yeah. to understand the rule and find the best position and cheat it. Yeah. Is cheat probably not the you know nicest word? Cheat codes. I, I call it cheat code because that's like you used to hack from video yeah. games. Like left arrow, up circle, triangle, yes. X. Oh my God, we got extra lives. Yeah. So basically, it, it really depends on where the money comes from and how does these people get the money. So it can be really difficult to say exactly how the rate can be like the, the example that I just gave you, like 2% rate unheard of in this market, but it exists. 
depends on where and how you get the money. Amazing. Right. So, all right. So we got the free money rate. We got the spread. We got the a cheat code. So three terms. We're two more terms in macro that people should know. Rate cuts. Ah, rate cut. Yes. It's, it's very easy to understand. Like the Federal Reserve cannot keep the interest rate. Basically, the, because the official name for that is fund, a federal funds rate. Yeah. They cannot keep the rate this high. People are, one is the psychology part. People are so used to this low interest rate environment for 20 years. Yeah. For it to go back up, one is not a lot of business are prepared for that. Yeah. Then, then that kind of lending rate, that's meaning the cost of the money is going too high. They have to cut their labor. They have to cut their the operation part, which is going to slow down the economy too much. Or raise much. their price. Or raise their price. Right. But for in the market that a lot of people are getting laid off because of the interest rate or you know, the cost of money go high, you raise the price. What's going to happen? There's There can be a... Oh, now I have another word yeah. called stagflation. Yeah. That means everything is expensive, but supply is low, but you, the, the price can't come down. Basically, that's the environment that you're in, which is also what's happening to the U.S. economy in the last century, 1970, late 1970s. That's basically also what happens. It's called a stagflation. People call it a depression. Not really a depression. There's a recession or a very long recession. But what really happened during 1970s was a stagflation. That's another word that people need to understand, which is not inflation, which is not deflation, which is it's like in something in the middle. So the prices won't go down, yes. even though supply is high, prices will, still won't go down. Yeah, and the demand is possibly very low. The demand is low, but why, so, but why won't prices go down in that situation? Like, why are the laws of supply and demand suspended in stuckflation? The stagflation, during stagflation, business needs, still need to make a living. What are you going to do if they lower the price? They're going out of business. So for them to survive, they have to charge a relatively high price. Not like they're making a lot of profit out of that. They have to survive. So this is like Southern California. We interview people and they come in, they have no skills, two years out of school, and they're like, I need $85,000. I'm like, you have lost your mind. I can get PhDs with also an MBA for 79000 and you have no skills. This is your second job out of college. Yep. Your first job was at Pete's Coffee and you need 85, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's what it takes to live. Like, I got to pay rent. I got to get groceries. I need two days off during the week at the beach. When you try and negotiate people lower, they're like, hey, I just won't take the job because I can't live. I think the mentality needs to be switched. The younger gen, I'm the younger generation, like and you can tell, I'm only like 15. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, 13. I was going to say 13, but I didn't know you had those extra two years, but it's good to know. Basically, this generation, something needs to change in their mind and then the social environment is basically pro-human pro all kinds of right but from at least my understanding is all kind of right come with a responsibility and then you have to have an understanding of this society is this, this is a society people's society you have to understand and the economy is built up based on people's activity you cannot expect Back, this is my standard. I need to get paid for what I worth, what I deserve. No, there's nothing called what you deserve if the market does not accept what you give. Yeah. But a, a lot of the, oh, well, it's very strange to say this in California, but the unions are basically training the people, saying you need to get what you deserve. But they don't teach people that you need to provide enough value for you to deserve anything. If you're not providing value to other people, to the society, that means you do not worth anything. Providing value to other people, to the society, is a big lesson people need to learn in today's environment. So why do we have, in, at least in California, and that's where I live, yeah. this like entire generation. So Pete's Coffee, where I like to get coffee, the reason I like to get coffee there, it's super good. Yes. It's to my taste, and they serve it nicely, and it's close by, and the coffee shop is clean, and it's a nice little center. Bressy Ranch, I go there sometimes, and they're like closed. We can't get any workers. And so they pay whatever, $20, $22 an hour, right? <laughs> coffee, and, they right. and for people to serve coffee. Every time you go in there, there's somebody different. And there's somebody different in there, different workers. They don't seem to know the store. But sometimes it's just closed. They're like, no workers came in today. We're closed. Right. And so how do we have this economy? What are the macros driving this economy in Southern California where people don't want to work? I got a friend that's asking me, saying, you you can help me find deals, but not in California. 
because California is nice, the weather is nice, but a lot of policies are forcing a lot of business to leave because a lot of people think, oh, business you're making, big corporations are making too much money. No, they have to look at their budget too. If you want to raise your $15 per hour, then say $20 per hour, then what's going to happen? Somehow, some way, that $5 needs to come out from other people's salary. So in California, unless they have to, I'm not expecting them to lower their minimum wage, but they cannot go up anymore. I'm very familiar with Hollywood. I'm very familiar with the unions. And the strike last year was a big shock to me because they're not helping themselves. Yes, they want a higher minimum wage. They don't want AI to compete with the writers, but that's going to happen anyway because the cost for a writer is too high for any kind of development to just keep throwing money at them. It's not like the writers, let's say they charge 20000 per draft. But then there's the second version, the third version, fourth version. The rate for these people keep going up. At some point, the investor will be like, I cannot do this anymore. I would rather find somebody, develop an AI that can write me a better script. Yeah than those writers. That's what's going to happen. So the strike last year, to me, is you're, yes, you're raising your hourly rate, your day rate, but what's going to happen is the investor are like, okay, my money that I invested in this movie or in this project are not, basically the value come down. Before, I spent two million to make a short, make an independent movie, I can get this kind of value. Now it's going here. But if you keep raising the rate, it's going to go here. Then investors are like, okay, that doesn't worth my effort. That $2 million can go somewhere else rather than throw it into this industry, which is not making me money. It's probably going to lose it all. What's going to happen to the filmmakers is they're not going to have project to work on. So it doesn't matter how high your day rate, your hourly rate go, you do not have project to work on, which means you're not making money. In real terms, yes, your uh, hourly rate is like $35 per hour. We don't have project, that's zero. I totally agree with that. How do we think about these complex macroeconomic situations? I'll describe one to you. So again, Southern California, young people can get by in the following way. So I say young, like 22 to 28 year olds. If you work at a restaurant or bar on the weekend, you are a social media consultant because you're at the beach. You can hold up a beer at the beach and you can have clients because you're in California and definitely culturally we have a language, right. we have a style, it's cool, it's fun, it's West Coast. You know, yeah. We call this West Coast finance. It's a particular style of finance that you don't have in the East Coast, you don't have in the Midwest, you don't have in Texas, you don't have in Canada. It's just like fast moving, on your toes, sharp, where you need to be, creative, technical, employing technology. It's like the West Coast style. So with your West Coast style, you can be a social media consultant or a web consultant, work from your home. Right. You can work at a restaurant or bar on the weekend, and then you can maybe have a part-time job two right. days a week. But so they won't come to an office. Mm -hmm. We try and offer, like we have people, we hire them here. Their first week, they're like, I'm taking Thursday and Friday work from home. Motherfucker, let me explain <laughs> something to you. This is a job. I'm in Southern California. There's absolutely no utility to me and you working from home because you're super high cost because you're here on the ground in California. So if I need you, I want you here at the office where you can learn, where you can have retained tribal knowledge, where you can help other people. Working from home does nothing for me because I have infrastructure here. And if I want someone to work from home, I get somebody from Kansas where it's cheaper, right? right? Or Philippines or China right. or you know wherever there's this currency imbalance. How does this resolve itself where you have a society so now my impression is, okay, so you, now you got 24-year-olds who want to work from home, be social media consultants, and work at a bar on the weekend to make things work, but they're not getting any career skills. So to me, this is a macro, right? Where now you're going to have a layer of society in Southern California right. that has no career skills and is not additive to society other than you can work at a bar and be a social media consultant, and at some point we're going to just saturate the world with social media consultants. How does this resolve? I think you cannot wake up a person that is sleeping and wants to sleep. For the younger generation that wants to be different from the majority of them, sadly, now in California, you have to provide, think about how to provide the value that means something to other people. It's, yes, you're providing the social media service, but 
let's say you, you need somebody to come into the office to do the work. If it's not here, that means there's less value for you. So if somebody come in, be like, hey, Oren, I want to work for you. Tell me what means, but, what matters to you. But what I'm saying, you. there aren't those people. Because it used to be, I listen to podcasts of people in finance, and a lot of them got started by saying, hey, right. I, this is what I did. When I started working in finance, I didn't have the baseline skills to make a lot of money. And I said, Russell, I will work for free as long as it takes. But I want it, when something goes down, I want to be paid as a partner. Yep. And so it was very hard, but I worked for free forever. Eventually closed the deal, made a bunch of money, and then started a career from there. And that saved me from having to go work at J.P. Morgan or right. so I was an intern and put... So I shortcut a six or seven year associate yes. career path to a year by saying, you don't have to pay me. But I, I don't just don't find those people in the workforce anymore. They just yep. don't want to work and therefore they're not getting the skills. How does that compare to China or India? What happens to America when we were just saying, hey, here's another thing, like at the coffee shop, it used to be they would go to Pete's and be like, hey, I want a cup of coffee and an ant shot, mm -hmm. drink I have all the time. So it used to be I walk in there and be like, hey, Orin, I'm getting it ready for you because they know what I drink. Now that doesn't happen. And they're like, what would you like? I'm like, motherfucker, I come in here every morning. <laughs> How can you not know this? <laughs> and I'm like, because they don't look up from the machine. So the other thing that used to happen is, so I go, okay, I like a medium coffee, a medium roast with an ad shot. And then there's all these people getting these latte and caramel right. latte and drinks that take four or five minutes to make. The person who took my order used to be like, I'll just go and get the shot and stick it in. Because it's just a cup of coffee with the ad shot, not that complicated. So they'd walk over to the machine, they run a shot, dump it in, or go over to the barista and say, hey, can you throw a shot in here? Have my coffee, I'm out the door. But today it's all that they, they put in the computer. Mm. Don't even look up. Don't need to see you. Don't need to think at all. Put it in the computer. I'm like, hey, man, that you, you just took my coffee. I'm going to be waiting behind these six or seven lattes. It's going to take me 20 minutes. Can you throw a shot in there? What? No, it's in the, like, I just, I put the order in. Not only do they not want to work, but in the more menial labor, because of the machines and the, the process-driven nature of it, they, they can't engage and, right. and do problem solving. What as a macro from the, like a social macro like that, how do you project then what is going to happen from generationally and how does that affect the economy? I thought I'd just throw an easy question at you. Of course, this yeah. sounds like a very very niche question. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I think I, I want to tell two stories. The first one is I think was one what's going to happen is people who wants to provide value that matters to the other person, these kind of people will do a lot better than the ones that be like, I get paid for what I deserve. What do you mean what, what you deserve? Define it. They can't. Most of the time they can't. Yeah. So there's going to be a big difference in wealth, in knowledge, in understanding of the world, yeah. even if it's within the same generation. Right. You know, there's some there's gonna be somebody that pop up. You can like I said, you cannot wake up a person who wants to stay yeah. asleep. That's what's what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a lot of intelligent people in this generation. But you're also gonna see a lot of people who are like whining about why is my life getting so much worse. Because and then also the game is changing now. Before, you feel like you had to make 10 bucks and invest eight. No, now the game is you make 10 bucks, you lever into a hundred dollar, and then you invest it. So you have to understand the change on the you know, rules of the game. That's how you want to catch up to what's going to happen in the future. You cannot say that you have to keep learning. So I think in this generation, there's going to be a difference there. There are a group of people who was going to go very well. They want to learn. They want to keep learning. They want to accumulate different kind of skill set instead of just push. So what's happening in our economy where there's a whole layer of society that believes like work is a secondary or thirdary or fourthary thing to their personal enrichment, their desire to travel. Like we hire people and they're like, mm, just want to let you know, they will literally signal coming in, hey, my desire is to travel. Like, no. why? So I have to I have to train. They're like, I'm not sure, but I want to go to Australia. I want to go see the world. I'm like, wait, I got to train you for a year or nine months, and then any one of those days you might just pop off to Australia? Why would you tell me that? I think or people need to understand themselves a lot better than I was. Like, a lot of people are like, my goal is to retire early. Yeah. Okay, you retire early, and then what are you going to do? Why do you want to retire early? What are you going to do after you retire? Stay at home and watch TV and play video game for the rest of your life? No, then you're going to feel like your life just, your life end 
when you stop either learning or you're working or trying to achieve some kind of goal. That's the fundamental of why people live. You have to have something to work on to keep climbing, to keep reaching a better goal for yourself to feel like, oh, this life is meaningful. But this is more of a, a spiritual stuff that's, I don't know if it's the best topic for this kind of show. I think it, it ties into the competitiveness of nations. So where then is the same effect in China? I would say yes and no. The wealthier a country gets, the more people feel like I have to fight for my human right. I'm not saying in China yeah. is, a lot of people say there's no human right in China. I think China is just not this, at the same stage as the United States. People still have to fight to work a lot harder just for their, sur their survival. But in the United States, because the United States has been a wealthy country for a long time, and people lost the passion, lost the motivation of trying to fight for something. In China, they're still at the stage. It's not only about human rights. It's also about the stage of that economy is still there. But yes, in China, a lot of the younger generation, they still work hard, but they also feel like, man, why am I working like nine hours a day and six days a week? They start to think about this because as the economy started rising in China in the past like 20 years, people's mentality is starting to change. I'm not saying um, it's a bad thing for people to think that way, but also you have to remember that there's a cost for any kind of choices. If you wanna not work for a long time and then just enjoy what government give you, yeah. then what's gonna happen is you're gonna basically get controlled by the government and then you lose the control of your own life. So that's basically what's happening in these two different countries. I'm not saying United States is bad in this term. I'm just saying United States has reached to a level that people are like, why am I even working hard? Because that's the natural way of thinking. People don't like to work hard. They bring that. People don't like to work hard on anything. So once there's a chance, people are thinking like, maybe I shouldn't. That's yeah. what frustrates me. I sometimes I talk about that when, because I was I'm born and raised in China for the first 17 years, and then I moved here. I get the idea of how the uh, United States is more about you have to rest well, you have to get the benefit and all that. But when people tell me like, oh, I want four days of work days and three days of rest days, what do you think? I'm like, I came all the way from China to here. I have some hard times. I come here not because I want to rest. I come here because I want to work on the things that I want to work on for however long I want to work on. So this is the, still the mentality that I have, which I'm not bragging about anything, but Lisa, who is standing outside of the frame, she used to be my boss yeah. just a few years ago. Yeah. And then now you're her boss. That's amazing. Not really her boss, but <laughs> <laughs> I just but, uh, but what happened in between yeah. is when I start working for myself, not for her anymore. Yeah, I'm like I didn't burn the bridge. I don't want to burn any bridges because you never know. One day down in the path, you guys gonna meet again. Sure. So especially like I have a we're already friend after working together for some time. So after I stop working for her, I still think about how I can help her in my own way. Of course, well, she's a very successful uh, real estate investor, but there's gotta be something that I can provide. And then I start my uh, own channel. I start my own journey on learning like deep into macroeconomic research. And I start gathering a, a group of audience, which actually very surprisingly, very good quality audience. And I was able to bring her some very high quality relationships and yeah. investors. I didn't do this to feel like, oh, that's my old boss. That's not even, like, why am I even considering that? No, that's about providing other people what you can provide. Even like you, do you need me for anything? Probably, I don't know, if it's the third person, they probably think, what's the relationship there? But I think there's always, you have something that the other person don't have and then you can, you can provide. So that's the mentality I'm still in. I think people need this kind of mentality today, especially in California. Yeah, I mean, for me, like the reason I need you from an economic standpoint is credibility. So what will happen is right. I'll meet some, like I raise money. I need, I'm raising two, three hundred million dollars, right? And so what will happen is I'll bump into somebody and they'll go, this is how it works for me. They'll go, okay, what's your project? Who are you? What are you doing? And then they'll poke their heads up and look for some like third party validation. Right. And they'll type Oren. 
uh, in and then they'll, maybe they know you and they'll see your podcast come up and like, oh, I'm going to listen to Orin and Joy. Love Joy. Uh, and Orin had a good conversation. She is obviously, this is her most watched episode. And so there's that third party validation and people go, oh, I'm part of a social network. Yeah. People don't like to put money or have fast moving relationships when there isn't a strong social fabric yeah. or related parties or some touch points or breadcrumbs or some ability to understand that person in context. So what I try and do through these is build context and awareness of my name. So my name carries a certain quality and aspect to it. And then people meet me and they go, oh, I like what you're doing. It makes sense. Other people I know are aware of you. You're woven in the social fabric that I'm in. And I could meet somebody or often do meet somebody with Chinese descent when they would be more familiar with your opinion than they would somebody from Kansas right. for somebody from Texas. And so that's that's what I do. That's where I wanted to land is sociology and the social relationships right. are very inexorably tied to macroeconomics. It's about people. It's not just numbers. Yes, exactly. Oh, it's a funny story. On the way here, I was on the airplane. I was looking at Twitter, like most of people probably will do. And I was looking at Twitter. Somebody posted, I'm having trouble persuading somebody. I think it's his wife. And then I have a friend recommending this book. And then I look at it, it's pitch anything. Oh, awesome. Oh, I sold the book? That's awesome. <laughs> I'm finally going to make a dollar from that damn thing. That's <laughs> right? awesome. So I was like, yeah. ah. So I, I commented, it's like, I'm on the way to see the author. So I'm like, That's oh, awesome. it's such a small world. But it's, yeah. it's, it's very interesting, like, how that happened right before I see you on the airplane. I was like, oh, you know what? Small world. You don't want to burn any kind of bridges. You're just being a nice person. People have own way of working their own life, working on their own life. But... Everybody has their own kind of audience. But when you combine the resources, that can be very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, I think, let's turn the corner on that. I definitely want to do this again. But small world, yeah. don't burn any bridges. Be familiar with the good way to get familiarize yourself with the power of understanding macroeconomics is think about the things in your local market. Right. The ice hockey or things that have supply and demand that affect your local market that force you to drive further that force people into your market. For example, the pop, not a lot of people know this, the population of Beverly Hills mm -hmm. is about 350,000 three, 350, people during the day, mm -hmm. shrinks to 33,000 people at night. Right. And so there's a huge demand for you know, people to come into Beverly Hills for restaurant, for shopping, for experience and everything. And then, it, but it's too expensive mm -hmm. to live there or stay there. So they retreat to mm -hmm. the suburbs or to wherever they came from at night. And so what makes people come into your local market, do trade and go back? What makes you go into other local markets mm -hmm. from a supply and demand standpoint? Real estate is a very good indicator of just basic supply and demand right. macroeconomics. And then extend your understanding, I think, of your local market into your industry. Mm -hmm. And then once you understand some of the tectonic plates and how they move in your industry, then you can move up into Fed and then into what the Fed is doing and more treasury policy. And you can get your own sort of macroeconomic degree backing into it as opposed to having to take two years off and go to Yale, Harvard, Stanford, Duke, Dartmouth, USC. Now the YouTube is so powerful. The research tools out there are so yeah. powerful. You pretty much don't need schools. If you want to learn, go on ChatGPT, ask where should I go to learn this kind of subject? And it'll guide you. If people have the mind to learn, to improve, they will find ways. Got it. And then what, Joy, where should people come and sign up for your YouTube and the things you're doing? My uh, YouTube, just my name, Joy Liu. You can yeah. search it and my L -I -U. face is going to be, L-I-U, yeah. is going to be on top. And then... I, I love your, your humility and how humble you are. It's going <laughs> to be on top. Okay, just type, <laughs> just type in J... On the internet, and it will just go directly to Joy Lou. Okay, so there's it's, only, it'll be right there on top. There's it's only actually one Joy Lou in the world that's okay. doing YouTube in macroeconomics. Okay, great. That's pretty much the that's the what you meant. Ultimate yes. reason, yeah. It. But it's not that hard to find me on YouTube. Uh, right, the so. only thing is, they're in Mandarin Chinese is a niche, but I also have interviews in English. So if you're okay while looking at the subtitles, then yeah, they're subtitled. There will be subtitles soon for every. Mandarin speaking episode that I did. Awesome. Okay. Definitely go look up Joy on YouTube and enjoy some of her videos. Thank you for being here and talking to me about this new favorite subject that I have macros. 
very happy to be here also. Thank you, Joy.